Hi, this is Paul. As I mentioned in my rough draft for Sunday, I took a couple of days off this week, which sort of compresses a normally busy week into even more busyness, but that's just kind of the way it has to go for me during uh, these weeks. And one of, the, one of the stories that I've been following is this um, Andrew Huberman story, which has just been fascinating to watch on a whole bunch of different levels. I, I first got in touch with this story when I saw Mary Harrington had written a piece on it, is Andrew Huberman, the new Jordan Peterson. And she, that's where I got tipped off to the New York Magazine expose. And she talks about this. Um, she talks about the, what she sees it as sort of a statue toppling incident. Um, uh, it's common when discussing the so-called crisis of masculinity to blame it on the loss of economic opportunity, the the changing educational landscape or other structural factors. A more uncomfortable um, possibility, though, is that at least part of the crisis is attributable less to structural shortcomings and even the failures of individual men than something more insidious, that is, kind of a baseline cultural hostility to the idea of prominent men entirely, particularly those who offer themselves as role models. Heroes have often had feet of clay. Even Achilles had one weak spot. This isn't news, but today, for some reason, it's becoming a sackable offense. I'm perhaps less troubled by, um, than some by Huberman's very ordinary philandering, but the point is that he wasn't in the stock. He wasn't in the stocks for infidelity. The Greek chorus of cultural levelers would have found something else to attack, and she kind of makes the point that, well, they, you know, they, they, murdered, they pretty much went after Jordan Peterson. Uh, they couldn't jo go after Jordan Peterson in terms of marital infidelity, and so they found other things, and so off it went. I, I thought Brett Cooper actually had one of the one of the better videos. I thought she covered it quite well, and she's I think in in a lot of ways the most charming of the Daily Wire cast. She is she is a lot of fun. She is a lot of fun to listen to, and she speaks quickly. Um, I had a number of thoughts on this, including how this plays in the religious imaginary. A few years ago, when Marianne Williamson, the first time she was running for president back in 20, for the election of 2016, when Donald Trump was running, Ross Douthat made the comment that she hasn't founded a new church. The, the churches are, in many ways, the podcast and the media empires. And, you know, we've been sort of playing in these waters and playing with these ideas for a while now. And what's what's interesting about the insinuation of going after Huberman is, well, he should be a moral exemplar with respect to with respect to what? Because with respect to his science, of course, there's been plenty of criticism, but there always is that. But even the the fact that there's criticism undermines the church of science in a similar way that, let's say, the Protestant Reformation undermined the church. Now, the rest is history is doing a significant series on the Protestant Reformation, and it's fun to listen to for a whole number of reasons. One of the points that, uh, that, that they made early on in the podcast is that you didn't have the Roman Catholic Church, it was just the church. It was the church was just what there was for most people living in the West. Of course, there was the division between the Eastern Church and the Western Church, but it was just the church. And and now with the loss of clergy, you would expect an attack like this, let's say, on a philandering minister. But Andrew Huberman is living the new lifestyle. He's a generation younger than Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson and his generation still got married had children, was faithful to his wife. Now, Andrew, to say, I say Alexander, Andrew Huberman is living the life, the archetypal life of the new man. He's unmarried. He has a succession of girlfriends. He's almost a monastic in terms of what he's doing. And he doesn't have a church around him. He has a podcast. And it isn't his attention to... Uh, certain holy texts that gives him authority, it's attention to science that gives him authority. Now, part of the messiness of the recession of modernity is 
the complexity of watching all of these things happen at once. Because it's almost as if people are, at least people who wish to attack Huberman, is it Huberman or Uberman? I don't know. Huber, I'll, I'll use Huberman, go with the, 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 the H. Those who wish to attack Huberman obviously are doing it for, are, are doing it for a whole variety of possible reasons. It could be the dying gasps of mass media. It could be New York Magazine realizing that a hit piece on this guy will result in clicks. I'm sure there are analytics for that clicks and the advertising for those clicks are through the roof. So whether or not it's true, it gets the clicks. If it bleeds, it leads and we're leading in a market economy. But of course, a priest, a monastic, a monk in the temple of science, well, then there's all this overlap because, well, so if evolutionary psychology is sort of the, the, the material out of which the scientist derives the certain information, and of course, there's all of this morality that sort of assumes in it, well, what should someone do? Well, according to evolutionary biology, again, Genghis Khan is the real winner in history because he had many, many genetic descendants and Jesus had so few. But then, of course, Jesus had so many in a different way, and so I've often contrasted Jesus and Genghis Khan. So what kind of archetypal leader is Huberman? Now, again, there's a video going around that he's a little interested in Christianity, but of course he's also interested in women. And, and whether or not these stories are true, um, again, as, as many people have noted, this is sort of New York Magazine um, <laughs> operating in, and tattletale journalism for the clicks. Again, you see the fall of mass media in this thing. Uh, it doesn't really matter because all that matters is here you have a popular guy and you should kneecap him and take him under, whether for culture war type reasons or just for the clicks or for whatever, and he's going to be the victim in this. And of course, there's plenty of YouTubes about it. Now, I thought as I was listening to this and I was listening to The Rest is History, the, the interesting contrast between the times. Now with the recession of modernity, we have these new gurus, these new monastics. And, and, and especially since the institutions which used to hold science now have, have been deteriorated in our eyes, especially through COVID. Now, now in some ways you have, the, um, you have the monastics. It's sort of an early institutional formation. Now, of course, the Protestant Reformation was the decline of much of this. So I thought I would take Huberman and contrast him a little bit with, with Luther here. Miners. And he wants to do this, I think, because he wants Martin to grow up and become a lawyer. Tom Holland is talking about Martin Luther's father, who wants Luther to become a lawyer to help with the family business. Yeah. And as a lawyer, he will then be able to help Hans with his contracts with his business and so on. Yeah, makes total sense. So the young Luther is sent to a school in a place called Eisenach in Thuringia. And one of the reasons that he's sent there is that this is where his mother comes from. And Eisenach is a place that is dominated by a huge castle on a great precipice called the Wartburg. Mm -hmm. And again, this will feature strongly in Luther's story. Yeah. And it is famous when Luther arrives there as the home of a Franciscan monk called Johann Hilton, who will die at the end of the century, so the kind of the turn from the 1400s to the 1500s, confined to a cell in the monastery and supposedly writing in his own blood before he dies. And the thing that's exciting about him is that he is an apocalyptic prophet. Right. And he is foretelling the ruin of the papacy, Dominic. Yeah. And the ruin of monasticism and the coming of a great reformer. No way. Who... Now, now it's interesting, the apocalypticism, and, and this comes out quite strongly in the rest of history. They, Dominic Sandbrook sort of brings it out and Tom Holling. There's a, there's a sense in the air, Kale Zeldin and I in our last conversation were talking about this. There's a sense in the air of, of both an end of one world and a beginning of a new world. And we certainly have that today. And someone like a podcast celebrity like... Andrew Huberman sort of typifies that. He's he's sort of both sciencey, but also 
against the conventional science. And so all of the, the theories about why this attack on Huberman for his, um, his sexual exploits, as we are, you know, of course, to be fully liberated with respect to what consenting adults may do, um, you know, here, here we are at the, this, this fold in history and one age is giving way to another. We'll change the world in the year 1516. Oh, it's just a year out. Mm. Well, I mean, the coming in the year 1516. I mean, Luther must be gearing up to it in 1516. <laughs> so just on the apocalyptic thing, I think that's really interesting that he's there and this guy is there. Because Luther must have known about him. He must have been a well-known figure in the town. Yes, I'm sure. I mean, if you're writing things in blood. Yes. So Luther is now, this is the late 1490s. So Luther is in his mid to late teens, very formative time. And actually, if we zoom out, as it were, pull the camera back, you can see why apocalyptic prophets are very, very much in vogue in the 1490s and so on, aren't they? Because there's a sort of apocalyptic tone to European life more generally because, you know, we think the headlines are terrible now, but they're pretty dreadful at the end of the 15th century. So the huge thing that has happened is that the French have launched this massive invasion of Italy in 1494, which ends up kicking off half a century of sort of chaos and carnage. Syphilis is spreading through the French troops. First time it's been known in Europe. And this is all going to culminate in the sack of Rome in 1527, which is this absolutely dreadful moment. But even more than that, the whole business with the Ottomans is kicked off in the Balkans. So the Ottomans have expanded under Mehmet and Selim and then, of course, Suleiman the Magnificent. And the most famous thing which would have happened, you know, it must be in Luther's mind, as it's in the mind of every single person in Christendom, Yeah, is that Constantinople had fallen in 1453. Well, and not just Constantinople, Dominic, because in 1480, actually an Italian city, Otranto, for a year has been seized and occupied by the Ottomans. And so I think it's not surprising that, that Hilton, in his prophecies, says that the Turks are going to end up conquering Germany and Italy. But people genuinely think that, though, don't they? They do, yeah. For the first time in, in centuries, they genuinely think these are the end times. You know, Christendom is going to be rolled up. Yeah. The Islam is coming. So in his book on the Reformation, Dearman McCulloch says, you cannot understand the Reformation at all. You cannot understand what's going on in Luther's mind or anybody's mind at the time without realising that as they see it, they are living in the end of days for Christian civilization in the world, that sort of darkness is coming. It's personified by the Ottoman Empire. And that's why when you look across the scene in the end of the 15th century, there are apocalyptic prophecies. There's talk of kind of monstrous births. There's all that kind of stuff. And Luther must be absorbing that when he's in this town where this bloke is locked up. Of course. And saying that there's going to be this reformer who's going to emerge in 1516, that the papacy is going to be destroyed, that the Turks are going to conquer Germany and that the world is going to end in the 1650s. 1650s, that's very precise. <laughs> very precise. <laughs> so this is... All now, again, Kale and I were talking about this. Um, I've been on kind of a Carlos Erie kick lately. And when you look at, when you look at this, this age of breakthroughs, now it's interesting because the rest of history is sort of focusing on the calamities that have been happening and the world-shaking calamities. But Kale and I talked about the fact that, you know, Almost all of the leaders of this movement are born within this tiny period. And you also have then, of course, the discovery of the Americas. So while the old world, the old Christendom can, you know, seems to be just coming apart and imploding a whole new world. And again, it's, it's sort of like Elon Musk and Eric Weinstein wanting to get us off this rock and onto another planet. Now, it's also important to remember when you're talking about this, that even though things for us seem a long time ago, things have been changing. You know, one of the things that I was, there was actually a first version of this video where I was mostly talking about Huberman. I was thinking about Gary Hart in 1988. Gary Hart has an affair and this basically disqualifies him from president of the United States. Uh, John Edwards, there's always, of course, scandals around Clinton in the 90s. Uh, the bimbo eruptions in 2008, I believe. John Edwards is running for president, and uh, news came out that here he, and, you know, I think his wife was ill with something, 
and a news came out that he had had an affair. And of course, this was a scandal and it topples him. Donald Trump runs for president. And of course, the Access Hollywood, he brags about what he's done. There's, um, there's stuff with porn stars. And, and, and for the most part, and nobody expects Donald Trump to be faithful to his wife because he never has been faithful to any of his wives, it seems, for, for a very long time. Oh, Stormy Daniels, that's her name. And, 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 and nobody seems to care. And, and so what you see is that through history, you see these you see these these movements go and you just sort of see examples of them riding the spirits, let's say. And uh, of course, they're subject to interpretation, et cetera, et cetera. But here we try to here we sort of say, OK, what's happening? What's happening around us? And contrast that with what's happening in, you know, at this pivot point between the um, between the 15th and the 16th centuries, this tumultuous time in Europe when the Ottomans seem to be to be coming in, the New World is discovered. Um, of course, sailing is going around Africa. The the Portuguese aren't the, the Spanish are desperate enough to to back Columbus, who makes this amazing discovery, which will bring immense amounts of gold into Spain and turn it into a superpower and, and on and on and on, just, just world-changing events going on. 16, that the papacy is going to be destroyed, that the Turks are going to conquer Germany, and that the world is going to end in the 1650s. 1650s, that's very precise. <laughs> very precise. <laughs> so this is all the kind of the background for Luther's childhood. But against that, there is also this sense that the future is bright, that the world is being reborn, if you want, that there is a renaissance. Okay. Because Luther will go on from Eisenach to go to university in Erfurt, which is the capital of Thuringia. It's the oldest university in Germany. And although he seems to have been quite an average student of his, his marks are to be gauged, he only kind of finishes about halfway, but he will graduate in 1505 as a master of arts. And the rest of his career will show that actually he is a brilliant scholar of Latin and particularly Greek. So he will translate the Bible directly from Greek into German for the first time. Mm. And it is in that sense that Luther, as well as being a product of this kind of apocalyptic environment, is also a product of the kind of the humanist renaissance, which is very much happening at the same time. So this, for people who don't know, this is obviously not humanism in your kind of Protestantism without God sense of today, like having a humanist wedding ceremony. No. So humanism is about the classical heritage and it's about a fascination, I guess, with books and words and stuff like that, is it? Is that fair? Yeah, and looking at texts kind of very closely. Right. So, for instance, throughout the Middle Ages, the translation of the Bible, the Vulgate, had been in Latin. Mm -hmm. But humanist scholars are kind of going to the Greek and indeed the Hebrew for the Old Testament. They're looking at the original texts and sources. And this is... Now, I just finished um, a draft. I don't know how we'll see. We'll see how many drafts this, this sermon goes through between the rough draft for Sunday and Sunday this week, because that's just kind of weak it is. But, but you... So I've, I've been in the Gospel of Mark, and then you come to the long ending of the Gospel of Mark. And that's a that's a fairly famous thing in that it's very few people deny, very few people deny. There's a great deal of consensus about the fact that the original ending for the Gospel of Mark was lost because it ends in such an awkward place and people tried to fill it in. And so the long ending for the Gospel of Mark uh, seems to be sort of an accumulation of things from Acts and the other Gospels, or maybe if it's early enough, it's from other eyewitness sources and just stories that were around about Jesus and sort of fills it in to end the book. And that felt fine. When you look at, for example, the Vulgate and what, um, what Jerome does with his translation of the Bible into Latin, it's fine to fill things out, and and you get a sense of the differences in the use of language, and and that that sort of gets highlighted and awakened when you see the here Renaissance humanism. And years ago, when I was using, I don't remember his name, uh, Philip Carey, I think that was his name. He's a professor of 
something somewhere, philosophy and religion. When I was just started making my videos, you had this turn towards the text. And you see that where, where suddenly everyone is very interested, not just in sort of getting the story right as you might imagine it to be in terms of how the story was told to you, but looking at the sources. And, and you can in some ways see this desire for sourcing, this desire for sourcing for greater accuracy, for greater truth in order to deal with uh, corruption, in order to deal with things that by, by people's dead reckoning feel terribly wrong. I mean, part of the corruption that people saw in the in the 16th century and earlier in the 15th and 14th century, with respect to the church, was that they would they would you know through the liturgy or maybe one way or another they would sort of have a sense of the teaching of Jesus, and then they look at how the church what the church is doing and and this sort of sniff test, this sort of dead reckoning is is the way by which many people operate. And this is this is by all means operating. And now that texts are increasingly available because of the printing press, people, more and more people now are literate and more and more people can begin to read texts for themselves. More and more people know Latin. And then of course if you do just a little bit of digging, you'll begin to realize that, well, the Bible wasn't originally in Latin. Someone must have changed it. And who knows whether or not the person that changed that text was true. Maybe if I look at the Greek, and you know, this is with us today when you talk about the Bible. Well, what does it say in the Greek? Well, this is what the NIV says, or this is what the King James says. But I want to know what it says in the Greek. And of course, once you get to the Greek, you begin a whole new odyssey because, well... How does this, you know, I've got a whole row of books behind me about arguing about this Greek or that Greek. And so, in other words, the Greek doesn't necessarily resolve this. And so that will lead beyond the Reformation period, beyond Renaissance humanism, into the uh, the scientific revolution where people will either look to imperial empiricism or rationality in order to gain certainty and truth. But you see the beginnings of it here. And what's so interesting is we're, we're just sort of seeing the endings of it here. And you sort of see the, the flailing about. It's a project that, you know, Luther will definitely buy into. Yeah. So this also is a kind of an influence on him. But when he graduates in 1505, it would look as though this isn't his future. He's not going to be focusing, say, on biblical scholarship because, you know, he's going to become a lawyer. This is what it's all about. So at this point... Now, we're not going to... Um, you'll get more of the story as you go into it, but of course, Luther will be traveling through the woods. He'll call out to St. Anne. He'll decide to become a monk because, well, the apocalypse is nigh. The end is nigh. He wants salvation for his soul. Now, well, I want to make two little things. Now, now Jordan blesses us all with a little offhanded remark that, you know, in the corner we've been, for a long time, I've been complaining about the use of this word literal. And what we're really getting at is how we should and shouldn't be using this word. It's like an artificial closure. And you talked about like a Scylla and Charybdis between the, the fictional and, uh, was it the literal at the top? Was yes, it? yes, yes. Like Which is like... Yeah like the arbit the skill and cryptus of the arbitrary and the algorithmic yes the skill and skill and cryptus arbitrary and algorithmic and the you know the notion of the literal if we really think about its etymology is that which is written down so the ability to point to what is in the, in the literature as being the final word in this like closed it's done it's not alive so with this turn to the text what we see here is the, the literal is that which is written down. That's what this looks to. And with Renaissance humanism, you have this turn to the text. You have this, well, the priests have been saying these things. They've been saying these things. When I came to this church 27 years ago, I got here and I, I discovered a whole bunch of little rules. And when I would ask about these little rules, where did these little rules come from? People would say, well, they're in the church order. And I would tell them, I've read the church order and they're not in the church order. And I could see basically that something in the Christian Reformed Church order had sort of been moved so that there was a rule to probably address someone. Then it became an oral tradition, and here were these rules. And so um, that rule literally was not in the church order. I mean, it was not written in the church order. 
But you see all the way back to Renaissance humanism, this turn that is happening where, well, without the printing press for years, the priests have been talking and the, and the, uh, the, the rulers in the institutions have been talking and talking and talking. And then someone finally says, now where is that written down? Well, we're the ones who can read. We're the ones who know Latin. We're the ones who know where everything's written. But show me. And, and you can see, again, this movement today where, well, public, scientific, medical dogma says these things. But, well, we don't ask to be shown in a book because we're not going to necessarily believe something that's been written in the book because books are just uh, proliferated anyway. We want to see the experiment done. And so then with someone like Andrew Huberman, well, he works at Stanford. And so he still has the air of that authority. And what will be interesting to see in all of this drama about his personal life would be if Stanford lets him go. But just like New York Magazine has interest in poking at the guy, Stanford has interest in keeping the guy for a similar reason that Luther wasn't executed like Jan Hus. Luther was kept alive because, well, his patron knew that he had something with Luther. But but my point here is this is this idea of what literal is. Um, and we are becoming, a journey becoming, becoming one who is more capable of participating in the fictional and, uh, was it the literal at the top? Was yes, it? yes, yes. Like Which is like, yeah. like the, arbit the skill and cryptus of the arbitrary and the algorithmic. <sighs> yes, the skill and, skill and cryptus of the arbitrary and the algorithmic. And the, you know, the notion of the literal, if we really think about its etymology, is that which is written down. So the ability to point to what is in the, in the literature as what is written down to point to what's in the literature. Now, today, we don't necessarily trust what's in the literature. We want to go, and again, and this is, you know, comes after the Reformation. We want to sort of get beneath and say, well, it's in the science. Well, the science isn't necessarily always helping us. And so, again, Andrew Huberman is someone that says, well, it's the science. And, of course, he's the monk because, well, he's 48 years old. He can juggle six women. He's... He doesn't have a lot of fat on his body. He looks fit and healthy. And so he then becomes the ideal that whole groups of people look to, especially men, and say, I'd like to be like him. And so then when it's discovered he's trying to juggle six women, a bunch of men say, well, that doesn't sound so bad. Well, I, I, I frankly, I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, one, one, one woman is usually more than enough. Um, but... This is, you know, we're dealing with sort of a hinge in history here. He's not going to be focusing, say, on biblical scholarship because, you know, he's going to become a lawyer. This is what it's all about. So at this point, when he graduates, yeah. there is nothing really about him to suggest the detonation that he's going to end up setting off. Yes. Tom, let's just take a break and we'll be back after the break for more Martin Luther all these kinds of things well actually you say he's obsessed with sexuality i'm not sure he is obsessed with sexuality actually that's people who think luther is a bit dry he's absolutely not he's very disputatious hot-tempered he's obsessed with the body impulsive yeah he's obsessed with sexuality all these kinds of things well actually you say he no no this is funny because tom's going to correct him but it's such an interesting thing that of course, we are supposed to be beyond the obsession with sexuality here. I would argue that our age is far more obsessed with sexuality than the Middle Ages was. You know, the the governor of New York State, you know, major state now gone. New York has gone from first to third in terms of probably states of significance. Uh, California and Texas are sort of vying for supremacy, and New York is. Poor New York is sort of in the third, but Governor Cuomo was unseated because he made passes at women, something that in much of the ancient world, nothing would have, nobody would have looked at. Now, again, I'm, I'm not saying this is, I am saying this is progress, but it's funny how when you have the loss of an institution where, let's say, in a church society, in a Protestant church society, you had a fair amount of policing of male sexuality. You had a fair amount of policing of the leader's values and teachings. It's what an institution does. Now, well, that's all sort of collapsed, but we're still doing the policing. It's fascinating looking at the compare and contrast here. 
He's obsessed with sexuality. I'm not sure he is obsessed with sexuality, actually. That's one of the things that doesn't obsess him. But he does have lots of other obsessions, you're right. Scatological obsessions, I guess. <laughs> Certainly scatological obsessions. We'll come to them. No, I don't think there's anything particularly at this point that would mark him out as, as anything exceptional. OK. And again, what makes it all the more improbable is that I think that there is a sense, particularly if you grow up, I think, in a kind of culturally Protestant country like Britain, you assume that it's just waiting for someone like Luther to come along and poke at the rotten oak yeah. of the medieval church and it will all just collapse. Fat monks. Watch that dynamic on YouTube around Andrew Huberman, around just about everything else. I think Tom Holland nicely phrases it, poke at the rotten oak. Of course, that's sort of the mystique behind Trump. He's poking at the rotten oak of U.S. government. Um I mean, all of these, the internet has sort of unleashed all of this suspicion and we're just poking at all of these oaks to try to find the rotten one to have it peel over. And of course, they're attacking Andrew Huberman because he's poking at the rotten oak and all the termites are coming out to, to defend their home. Fat monks, corruption, you know, people having feasts while the peasants are starving. Yeah. Uh, fake relics. Tom, I hate to tell you, but I think for about the first 30 years of my life, that's pretty much what I thought. I mean, I kind of still deep down think was the story with the Catholic Church, but you are now going to tell me that's not right at all. Okay. Now, what's coming up here is super interesting. I've been listening to the show for years, and I've listened to the vast majority of the episodes. I followed it right from day one. Of course, I've been following Tom Holland. I know I haven't treated the Justin Brierley, Tom Holland conversation or the Marian Vision or any of those things. Um, I'm sure I will get to it at some point. But Justin Brierley's point is that the times are changing and they are changing. You can hear them change by listening to the people. And Dominic Sandbrook in earlier episodes was just completely dismissive and, and Tom Holland could himself be skeptical. But now pay attention to the changing of their attitudes and pay attention to the use of the word literal. And again, we find again and again, it is poorly used. Physical would be better, but, but again, even whether you're using the word literal as sort of a substitution for physical authority, which is sort of how it wound up, but even physical points to the worldview after the turn to the text. The worldview that says, well, if we want to know the truth, we have to look at the physical layer. And we're, in fact, even renegotiating that. Well, so I think that assumption is hardwired into the very phrase, the Reformation, with a capital R. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, that's a very, very Protestant perspective. And, in fact, right the way up until the end of the 19th century, it's only Protestants who ever use it. Because I think Catholics would point out that Reformation, which comes from the Latin word reformatio, remaking, is actually, it's not specific to Protestantism. It is something that has been continuous throughout the entire history of the church. And the truth... Okay, now a little bit of poke at Sam's conversation with, um, with Trent Horn. Because one of Sam's hobby horses is this question of a continuing, evolving... And so part of what happens, let's say, in, the, in, the, in these continual Protestant reformations that happen is everybody's trying to get back to the source. And so when you look at, let's say, the, the burned over district that produced the LDS church, it produced the Jehovah's Witnesses, it produced the Seventh-day Adventists, you see this, this fever pitch in 19th century America of, of grasping at certainty. There's so many different versions of Christianity around. We need to have the true one. And so we're going to go back to the, we're going to go back to the text, usually again, to the Bible itself. And so the beginning of the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, where they, I'm, I'm not going to read the Bible listening to all of these experts on the Bible. We're talking the 19th century here. This sounds very contemporary. I'm not going to listen to any of these experts on the Bible. I'm going to read it with my own two eyes, and I'm going to interpret it under the plain meaning of the text. And you, you have this just 
this launch at the end in the 19th century of all of these different little denominations, especially in America, that are doing this. And again, they're, they're trying to get down to the roots. They're trying to get to the source one way or another. And, and you see this dynamic. The is that the medieval church that the Protestant Reformation overthrows is itself the product of a reformatio, is itself a kind of revolutionary yeah. institution because the first reformation, and this is important background to understand what Luther is about because the first reformation happens not in the 16th century but in the 11th century. And it matters because the second reformation is, you know, it's a reaction to it, but it's also bred of it. Mm -hmm. So I think we should just give a portrait of this reformation because it is what Luther is getting. And I like that turn of phrase Tom just used. It's a reaction to it. And what we see right now is a reaction to modernity, but it's also bred of it. And I think that's and that's a very common dynamic as you see these transitions. Luther is going to be reacting against. So the key features of this rep so, so someone like Andrew Huberman is both a reaction to the institutions of science, but it's bred of it. He's a modern monk. Evolutionary institution that is the medieval church. It divides the world into two in a way that had never happened before in any kind of culture in the world. You have a dimension of the cyclum, which is the kind of the earthly mortal dimension and will give us the word secular. And then you have the dimension of the church, which is radiant and pure and constitutes the link or the religio in Latin to heaven. So there you have kind of what will become the key dividing line in which we still have to this day between the secular and the religious. And the clergy who are called the religiosi, these are the people who guard the dimension of the religio, the bond joining. Okay, so now what you see with the Church of Podcast is that someone like a podcast star like Andrew Huberman well, he is the he is the religio. He connects heaven and earth. Well, what 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 on earth do you mean by that? He's not claiming anything heaven. No, but what is it? What is the ideal? Well, he's embodying the ideal. He's embodying the ideal with having a a certain resting heart rate, with having a certain low body fat, with being able to do physical strength at at age forty six. And for some, being able to juggle six women, Jordan Peterson, again, a decade earlier, uh, being able to have a marriage with one wife. And then he goes on Bill Maher, and Bill Maher basically says, yeah, marriage is all about settling. And Jordan Peterson brags how when he and Tammy get in the room, they can not they can barely keep themselves from pulling each other's clothes off. He says that on Bill Maher. <laughs> but, but it's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a practice of again the ideal so basically jordan peterson is trying to um continue to defend monogamy and that ideal whereas huberman is is sort of defending the um let's say the evolutionary biological practice of the ideal not necessarily spreading seed Except who knows what earth is going on with the uh, in vitro fertilization process with these older women that he is dating. But anyway, it's I mean, it's all insane. But if you look at it, you can see the contours of the waves. It's reacting to it, but it's bred of it. Joining humans to heaven. So these are, dare I say, professional Christians, which is quite unusual anywhere in the world to have a class who take up in some places... And so you can see Huberman has in some ways become a professional man. He's become a professional man. He's become the ideal man. He's a man of science. He's, you know, he's an archetype. He's, he's successful with women. He's successful with science. He's successful. He's the kind of man that, uh, that a certain kind of other men look up to. And now well, women have them too. You could look at Taylor Swift. You could look at... Uh, People look up to, you could look at Kim Kardashian, people look to all kinds of women. There's also a deep generational divide here. Um, and, and whereas the generation that wouldn't vote for Gary Hart or, see, and again, it, it, it plays both sides of the aisles, Gary Hart or Bill Clinton. I mean, it, it used to be imagined that it would, it would be the Democrats who would be the ones who would have uh, 
uh, would have zipper zipper control problems because, of course, the Democrats were supposed to be kind of the progressives. They'd be the ones on the side of the sexual sexual revolution, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, if you compare Obama and his marriage to Trump and his marriages, the whole thing just sort of falls apart. So ten percent of the population, their job is just to be Christians. Yes, and they are marked by chastity which again is very distinctive and which really only is introduced in the 11th century and by their, their use of Latin, mm -hmm. which is again a kind of marker of the fact that they, they belong to a universal, timeless church. They have a very complex hierarchy, obviously with the Pope at the head of it and beneath him there are all kinds of different clergy. So there are what are called secular clergy, clergy who are operating out in the dimension of the cyclum with the laity. These are like your friars and whatnot. So these are the archbishops, the bishops. Right right the way down to the parish priests. The friars, the monks, the nuns, these are called regular clergy. So these are people who are taking the kind of the narrow path to heaven, but the surest path to heaven. And they, in a way, are kind of storing up kind of uh, benefits for the vast mass of the Christian people. Because like all revolutionary institutions, the church gets its validity from offering people the promise of a better life. So you have justice on this world in the... Okay, so Andrew Huberman, what is, his, what is the main thing he's offering? He's offering a better life. He's offering better longevity. A big thing about Huberman is longevity. Uh, better health, better strength. And now, and this is why many on Twitter are like, Oh, sign me up for what he's got. If he can, if he can, and, and the, the New York Magazine piece keeps lauding the, um, these are beautiful women, these are brilliant women, these are amazing women, and he has six of them. So men are on Twitter just saying, okay, well, he, he must, he's offering a better life. He can have six women. This world in the mortal world, and this justice is provided for people as a result of a kind of entire framework of law that derives from the church fathers, from mm. church councils, from decrees of the popes. And these are collectively known as canons. So the framework of church law is called the canon law. And this is seen as expressive of God's justice. And there's always a tension, isn't there, between that, the canon law, and the separate hierarchy that the church has and its own practices, its institutions and all that stuff. Yeah. There's always a tension between that and like the local king, Henry II, Henry VIII, whoever, who thinks they're kind of invading my privileges. And, you know, <laughs> that doesn't start with Henry VIII wanting a son. No, no, it doesn't. That's been there for centuries. Uh, dread Christian nationalism goes all the way back to the beginning, boys and girls. <laughs> it always does. And, and of course, you have, you know, those tensions are very much in constant in Constantine because he is, well, why does he want a religion that works? Because the religion that works, works. And and so again, in, in many ways, sort of this hinge we are at is is draws on ancient pagan ideas. Um, in some ways, Huberman's, Huberman's philosophy points to, you know, something more Greek or Roman, let's say. Um, it's certainly of the secular, it's not of the heavenly. So, you, again, you just watch these tensions. They don't go away. Sure is. Canon law begins to be constructed in the 12th century and by the 16th century, by, by the time of Luther. It's this vast edifice, as also is the edifice of the spiritual economy mm -hmm. that the church is presiding over. Because, of course, what it ultimately is promising is the promise of heaven, of salvation. But what will prevent you from getting to heaven is sin and Sin, you know, if you're not going to go to hell, you have to pay it down. You have to get rid of it. And this is where indulgences come in. So indulgences... Now, now Tom does get this right here, but of course, there's no paying your way out of hell. There's paying down your purgatory debt in order to get into heaven. They can wipe your sin completely clean. But Tom, you're not going to hell straight away, are you? Well, so effectively, if you were sinless in this life, which is almost impossible, so even saints, yeah, you might go straight to heaven. But the vast mass of people are going to have to, to work off their debt of sin in a place called purgatory. So that's like a waiting room. 
Is that right? You're not. It's not hell. A waiting room with fire. So it's like a lesser hell. Uh, yes, it's like hell with a time limit. So you've been, you know, a terrible man. You're Himmler. You're going to hell. You're just a common or garden offender like you and I. You know, we're ordinary sinful people. We might go to purgatory for a thousand years. You know, who knows? Uh, I think in your case, Dominic, it's slightly longer. <laughs> Thanks. Compare me with Himmler. Um, <laughs> but you could work this down. Yeah. So you could make prayers to the saints and the Virgin who will intervene with God. Yeah. Or you could, you know, charitable donations, good works. You could go on a pilgrimage. And above all, there are there are masses. And the mass, it's the celebration of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And it's made vivid and real in the bread and wine. Christ is literally present there. And this is a way... Literally present there. What says so in the writings? Well, how is he present? Well, literally. No, no, that, that doesn't that doesn't answer the question. Of course, Calvin says spiritually, which I think is a better answer. Is he physically? No. For the Christian people to kind of experience a sense of common identity mm. and to commune with the mystery of their faith. So this is why churches are set aside as sacred places so you have images you have icons you have incense you have all the kind of stuff that i'm sure would uh rouse your protestant suspicions i actually like icon stuff <laughs> i love an icon <laughs> good good i love the kind of uh, the orthodox church big fan of the orthodox church but the role that masses play in oh no they're getting another one <laughs> in the spiritual economy is that they are kind of believed to transcend place and time yeah. and to link all Christians to you know, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. And therefore, they have an incredible efficacy in burning away the sins of the dead in purgatory. And so by the 15th century, the idea of wealthy people paying monks or whoever to perform masses for the dead mm. has become a crucial part of Christian piety. So Tom okay, and so now, of course, Jesus, who says it's easier, it's easier for uh, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven, this seems to invert that. It seems like it's far easier for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than a poor man because he can pay the indulgences and get out of purgatory quicker. Now, this, this gets way more complex when you think about if you sort of follow what I've been doing in my sermons for a little while, because in the ancient world, of course, where it's you don't have this heavier division between the eternal and the secular, where just the, the physical is an expression of what's coming down from heaven. And Abraham, Job, and wealthy people are, in fact, by definition, blessed by God, and you can see it because they're wealthy. And this, of course, sets up the whole premise of the book of Job. Two points about masses. So one is, in a weird way, actually, I never thought I'd say this to you on this of all subjects. I think you're almost slightly underselling what a massive deal, literally a massive deal, the mass is. Because most people would only go and take communion once a year. Is that right? And they would get the yeah. bread, but not the wine. The wine is reserved for the priest. But this is a, a moment of extraordinary power in your life, right? Yeah, it's almost as though you were approaching the yeah. heart of a nuclear reactor or something. The mass is the reactor that is powering everything. Right. And it's so potent that only priests can approach it. And even then, only with extreme care. Yeah. And for the laity, you know, it's too dangerous to approach. Right. It's the bit of the Raiders of the Lost Ark when they take the lid off the Ark of the Covenant and all the stuff is flying out. Just watch how these two are processing this. And, and a little bit more now. Yes. That's the moment in your life, isn't it? Where, I mean, God is literally there. Yeah. Literally there. Literally in the bread and wine. Literally, literally, literally. Now, earlier when he said mass and literally, that was the proper use. But literally in the bread and the wine. Okay, literally, because it's written there. It's written in the Bible there. But now they're going to get into a little bit deeper. Yes. The, the bread and the wine are the body and blood. I mean, God is literally present. Mm -hmm. But also the other thing I was going to say, that thing about saying masses for the dead to get you out of purgatory. But am I not right in saying that that industry, because it is an industry, is more developed in Germany than in any other part of Christendom. So somebody like Luther growing up 
it looms again massively large in a way that it wouldn't if he was in Italy or Spain yeah. or somewhere where the mass industry is not quite as developed. So that explains why he ends up kicking against it and why it becomes so incredibly controversial in Germany and Switzerland in the kind of Baltic and Scandinavia and so on. But again, I mean, it takes some time to take the dramatic step of kicking against it. Because I think to begin with that, you know, he's a schoolboy or he's a student. Mm -hmm. He's not really thinking about it. Because for most people who are not kind of professional Christians in McCulloch's formulation, this is, it's not something you necessarily believe in, in the way that we believe or don't believe in things. Because this is part of the course of modernity that Luther is going to set Europe on. Right. So I think for most people, it's just kind of part of yeah. the air that they breathe in. And I think it's one of the aspects of the pre-Reformation culture that is hardest for us to get our heads around. Because I think that the way that the Reformation changes our relationship to belief is one of the profoundest aspects of what makes it revolutionary. So for us, what do you believe in or what don't you believe in? It's, it's a crucial marker of our identity. But it's really, I think, different, say, in 15th century Latin Christendom. So say when Christians call Jews or Muslims unbelievers, they're not really defining them in terms of the fact that what Jews or Muslims believe is wrong. It's just that they don't, they don't believe in the stuff that everyone in Latin Europe is taking for granted. So, Tom, I loved this section in your notes because it really, I mean... Sometimes I'm very hard on you and the rest is history, but I think here I just thought, wow, this is so interesting because like many people, you know, I'd, I'd often thought, did people really believe this? You know, did they really believe that the body and blood turned into all that stuff, you know, relics, indulgences? How could they believe it? But I think what you're bringing out here is that in a way they don't really think about it. No. Because why would you? Yeah. It's like you and I know, for example, that you know, human beings need oxygen to survive or that the universe was born in the Big Bang. But we only know that because everyone we know thinks it, we've been told it, and we take it on trust and we just take it completely for granted. And that's how they thought about the devil, indulgences, purgatory, all that stuff. They didn't sit up at late at night debating whether or not it was true. No, because it obviously was true to them. Well, I think a kind of a really fascinating parallel would be with, say, people's attitudes to epidemiology during the COVID lockdowns, that most people accepted what they were told by the epidemiologists, because why wouldn't they? It's the epidemiologists who know. Mm. And so the theologians are the kind of the medieval equivalent of epidemiologists. And you may wonder, well, you know, how do they know? How do they get their certainty? And they get it because they have revelation in the form of scripture. But also they have what is called by intellectuals in the universities, scientia, so science. But it's not science in our sense. It's, it's the knowledge that can be deduced from revelation via kind of deduction, via rigorous study. And so, so this is how purgatory comes to be right. deduced. Purgatory is not mentioned in scripture, but you can deduce it from kind of various conclusions that can be drawn from scripture. And so the whole edifice of, you know, this, this kind of framework of belief is like a kind of enormous cathedral that you don't have to go into the cathedral to be aware of it. It is looming up over you. You know, because they're the experts. Exactly. And only a madman, you know, in 2024, somebody who said, well, I don't believe the world is round, actually. You know, you would be like, oh, it's just eccentric for the sake of it. What's the point in going against what everybody knows to be true? Well, let's pursue that COVID analogy. Of course, during COVID, there are sceptics. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people who kick back against what the medical establishment are telling them. And so likewise, in the Middle Ages, of course, you do have people who are kicking back against what the church authorities are telling them. And these are people who, of course, are called heretics. Right. And if they're inveterate as heretics uh, and they refuse to recant, then they're burnt. And... In the 15th century, there is quite a vivid consciousness of this tradition. Because there have been lots of heretics, haven't there? There's been a guy called Peter Valdo in France. So then they'll go through that. And then those of you who are familiar with the Reformation will be used to these names. But just watch how, you know, when I, I try to think of mental images to, to 
conceptualize what's happening now with the recession of modernity and and I don't know if uh, I don't know if uh, Nathan Jacobs said it I think he said it it's like we we've seen the edges of modernity and and once we see the edges of it now we know that it's a thing and once you see the edges you can get a sense of it's you're going to go beyond it okay what is beyond it well it, it sort of means you're no longer captive to it. And it, just listening to these two talk about believe. I mean, this is what Jordan Peterson was talking about six years ago when he goes, do you believe in God? Well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to use that word that way. So everybody's like, what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? You're, you, what, what do you, why, are you, why are you playing around with language like this? And, well, Tom Holland's been playing around with it. And now it's, it's gone to Dominic Sandbrook. And you can just feel it continue to go. And so we're at these moments when something happens. New York magazines decide we're going to do an expose on Andrew Huberman is sleeping with more than one woman. Hmm. And he hasn't fully disclosed to all of them. Oh, is that the crime? Okay. <laughs> you can just see how many different issues in our culture just get triggered. And you know, tides are changing now, just like in the, the turning from the 15th to the 16th century, it gets apocalyptic, it gets scary. On one hand, what we've known is passing away and something else is coming. Will it be good? Will it be bad? It's fascinating to watch. All right. I, if this made any sense to you, let me know.